Today's edition of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that I've been lucky enough to be using for a little over a year now. Only rivaled by the impeccable customer service that Kevin and his staff provides, Coach Me Plus's ability to constantly be amoeba-like in their ability to mold and, and matriculate what you're trying to get across and bring together is, is absolutely fantastic. Their constant pursuit of better ways and better methods and, and innovations and progress to their own product is absolutely fantastic. Go over to CoachMePlus.com, check out what they got, guys. It's, uh, it's something that I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the distinct pleasure of sitting down with the Freak Factory's Hunter Charneski. Guys, we're going to talk about developing basketball players. You know, we're going to start out talking about how he got into it and, you know, the broad spectrum of athletes that he gets to work with and where he sees, you know, the training program developing them and, and steps that he takes when it comes to working with his athletes. Uh, we then get into his idea of maximizing the mundane, which I think is really an awesome term and uh, a really interesting part of the discussion. Then he gives us some examples of what he does in these initial training periods. And then he really, you know, gives a lot of credit to his mentors and discusses what he's learned from, who he's learned from, and, and how it's impacted his training with his athletes. And then, then we finish, guys, talking about how his program adapts with what equipment and things that he has available to him uh, working in two different situations, both in the university setting and in the private sector. It's, it's really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. And all right, here we go. Hunter, thanks for being on with us today, man. Hey, Jay. Thanks for having me. Happy so, to be here. Yeah, so listen, let's talk hoops. You know, we're, we're in two pretty different, interesting situations. So I think that this is going to be an awesome talk. Let's start with how you got into basketball, and then let's let's go from, you know, what you're seeing and what you're doing and, and build from there. Well, I'm, uh, I own my own facility here in town in West Michigan. Uh, it's called Freak Factory. And uh, my alma mater, Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan, is about 10 minutes away. I played football there from 2010 to 2013, and I still have a good relationship with the coaching staff there, uh, Coach Mitchell and Coach Ginn, the guy who oversees their strength program, uh, gave me a call one day, wanted to know if I wanted to do some consulting uh, nutritionally as well as uh, the physical preparation side of things. And um, I had just sent out an email to the entire uh, athletic department at Grand Valley, uh, letting them know my situation with football, and I only got one response back, and that was from the uh, the head coach of the basketball team, Coach Rick Wesley, and uh, him and Coach Mitchell, my old head coach, they got a good relationship. They uh, uh, he gave him a call, said, uh, "What's Hunter like? Is Hunter legit?" And um, I had Mitchell, I had Coach Mitchell's endorsement, and uh, had breakfast with the the basketball staff uh, about a year ago, and uh, I guess the rest is history. I guess, and then I've. Uh, sort of carved out my own little niche here as sort of the basketball guy in West Michigan, if you will. No, that's awesome, man. Um, and, and being up north there, there, there are some things that may be challenging, but there are more things that may be challenging just when it comes to developing these guys. So what are you seeing? Because you're not just working with Grand Valley. You've got a bunch of youth kids that you're dealing with too, correct? Yes, so exactly, let's, yep. let's talk about that development. Let's talk about how dealing with, you know, the AAU youth kids and how you build with them and how that changes or doesn't change when you start dealing with your collegiate athletes. So with the youth, you you have, I think it's it's my belief that you need to definitely maximize the mundane. And by, what I mean by that, Jay, is people, the coaches will get bored with the exercises um, and, the, and the parameters far before the athletes do. So um, we don't need. I don't. I don't see any reason to put a bar on the kids' back for for quite some time. Um, a lot. A lot of relative strength. A lot of crawling patterns. Uh, goblet squats. Uh, things of that nature. Um, just getting them used to their own body, if you will, and uh, putting mobility and stability and and where it needs to be. Uh, I think those are a premium in the private sector, uh, especially with these kids who are just playing games all the time and they're on the road all the time. It was. It was funny. We just actually just got a. 
a big kid uh, last week. Um, he's a he's a six ten junior, and Coach Wesley was actually at my facility where him and I were just talking shop, and the kid came for his first day, and he, Coach Wesley's like, "You need to be doing more of this than actually playing the game itself." You know, skill development is not is not made simply by playing more games, and that was, that just came out of Coach Wesley's mouth, and I think that was, I thought that was rather profound. Um, so yeah, that's definitely what we focus on at, at my facility. Um, when we get more into the team setting. Obviously, it's a it's a little bit different from a, from an equipment standard, especially being at Grand Valley State. It's, it's a Division two institution. We don't have all the bells and whistles like Michigan State or uh, the Wolverines in Ann Arbor. So um, definitely got to get more creative on that. And I don't have all the tools at my disposal when I'm over uh, with the team as I do at my facility. Um, but when I'm when I'm over there, uh, if I were to talk about my off season program with them. Um, it's a, I, I, place a, I place a high premium, Jay, on uh, an anatomical adaptation period. I think that's uh, very crucial, not only just to start developing that uh, ever-important aerobic base, but also to make sure that the, the tissue is ready for the more uh, challenging demands that, I'm gonna, that are going to come in my program. Um, and I can, we, can, we can expand that if you want. Do you have any questions at this time? No, I think that if you keep going off that, I think that's awesome. Because let's, let's see where, that, where you're rolling with that. Like, okay. Let's go. How you build? What you're building? What you're looking at? Let's let's rock that. That's that's big time stuff. Okay. So so we just we just started our uh, our summer program uh, at Grand Valley, and I'll uh, have the guys for the next six weeks. They had a few weeks off for uh, for uh, exams after the season uh, was over, and uh, right now, like yeah, it's just sort of a, another um anatomical adaptation period like i talked about i have to go down to the least common denominator some guys did stuff when they were home but something some guy and some guys didn't but uh we're just gonna roll them right back through an anatomical adaptation period and the way that looks jay is we'll have seven seven to nine exercises depending on how i feel the guy's readiness is and anywhere between uh 10 and 15 reps per station um and uh we use a a a uh, or, or uh, we'll hit on this as well the one thing i really like that we've been using lately jay for during this block is on a wednesday we'll do i'll take 50 percent of their front squat max and i'll take 50 percent of their bench max and the players just go back and forth hit a single on front squat hit a single on bench hit a single on front squat hit a single on bench and they'll do that for eight minutes and they're getting in that heart rate range I want. It's not too taxing. They can hold a conversation while they're doing it. That's when that's the easy way to tell if they're in that aerobic zone is if they can hold a conversation while they're doing it. They're getting some hypertrophy with the volume, and and they're getting stronger all while building an aerobic base. Uh, I stole that from Cal Dietz. He's a guy I look up to in this industry. Uh, I really love that tactic during this uh, this aerobic base anatomical adaptation period. Uh, and then. Uh, as far as like the way my program ex- evolves from there, uh, we use a tier system template. Uh, Joe Ken's a friend of mine. I, I love I love the tier system. I believe that uh, sports, especially the game of basketball, is played toe to head and head to toe. Uh, so I think we need to train the athletes that way. I've never seen one of my guys play the first half of his upper body and the second half of his lower body. So we train the athletes toe to head and head to toe every time we're in the weight room. Uh, another friend of mine, uh, Mike Robertson. Uh, I, I use an R7 protocol. Um, we'll, we'll, so we'll do. We'll hit the releases. We'll hit the resets, readiness, um, reactive, resistance, resiliency, uh, anything like that. So I, uh, plug it in where I see fit. And I'm also a huge fan uh, of the high-low approach. Uh, I, I went out to Buddy uh, Buddy Morris in uh, in Arizona. Talked to him. Pick his brain for a little bit. And I'm also uh, whenever I have a question about speed, I just literally pick up the phone and get Derek Hansen on the phone. He, I think he is truly one of the best developers of the one biomotor ability that everybody wants more of, and that's speed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we definitely we definitely do. I love the high-low approach for that reason. It gives us the, the opportunity to train what quality I want for that day. And um, it also lets the athletes super compensate. They're always super compensating sort of the stair-step approach and working. We can go – uh, we can train harder, longer, if you will, without having to take a, a full deload week. Um, and I, I might be a little, a little uh, unorthodox, or people might look at me funny when I say this, but uh, I sprint our guys a lot. I, I it's, it's, uh, during the adaptation period and some of the earlier stages of the program in the off season, 
we're already building in acceleration to our tempo work, Jay. And so the guys will the guys will get out for the first 10 and then they'll coast the rest of the way. Um, just already building in that acceleration component. And we address it every single day, Jay. Uh, acceleration is a skill. Uh, and if it's a skill, it needs to be addressed daily. So we, we apply it and address it uh, daily. And that's based on position. So the, some of the smaller guys, uh, the point guards and such, will get 150 yards in every day. Uh, some of the, the middle the middle of the pack guys will get 100 yards. And then the, the bigs, the centers, the power forwards, they'll get about uh, at least 60 yards a day. Um, so we're always building an acceleration. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays are our lifts. Uh, and like I said, I use the tier system template. So Monday's a T day, uh, Wednesday's an L day, and Friday's a U day. Uh, on those days, we do sprinting. Uh, sprinting will be addressed on every single day. Monday, it'll be sprinting and agility. Wednesday, it'll be uh, sprinting and plyometrics. And Friday, it will be just just sprinting. Um, I, I like to progress it um, and add more and more volume as the summer goes on. Obviously, the optimal sprint volume for a sprinter is 600 meters. These guys are not Olympic sprinters. So I work anywhere between 100 and 300 meters of total sprinting volume on a high CNS day. Obviously, starting with more towards the 100 in the beginning of the, of the off season, working up more and more towards that 300 number uh, later in the off season. And then uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays are our tempo days. And with that, we do just a really easy um, agility session, and then we'll we'll get it right into our tempos. Uh, we actually take a long to short approach on the tempo work. So we'll start at anywhere uh, right around 2,000 meters of tempo work, and we'll work it down, making them more intensive to more the the 1,000 meters uh, towards the end of the summer. And we and we take a, a short to long approach on the uh, on the sprint volume for the guys. Um, jumps, I love Bobby Smith and the guys over at Ripped's uh, Prolipin's chart uh, jump sheet. Uh, I think that's I think that's awesome. Uh, that makes it makes it really easy, and it's a, it's a great system. It takes all the thinking out of it, um, and we use those for either primer or PAP, Jay. So if if it's more of a more of a strength block or more strength is more the emphasis on the, on that particular day, I like it for PAP. Uh, if if, it, if I'm in season and the the uh, the focus is more dynamic effort, I like I like jumps as a primer, um, but. Yeah, so I like I said, I love sprinting our guys. I think sprinting has a, a lot of benefits. I think the better question, instead of people saying, you know, Hunter, why do you sprint your basketball players? I think the better question would be, well, why wouldn't you? Uh, it, it, these guys uh, are putting out um, far more force into the ground that they're than they're ever going to have on a barbell with each stride at max velocity. So sprinting will actually drive up weights. Because it's five times ground reaction forces, seven times muscle skeletal forces. So if it's strength you speak, if it's strength you seek, sprint your guys. Um, and uh, I think I think one of the more brilliant things Derek told me is, uh, it's the safest expression of fight or flight there is, right? I mean, if if you're watching Animal Planet with your kids or Discovery Channel and you see a cheetah chasing a spring buck, at any point does does either animal pull a hamstring? It just it just doesn't ha- it just doesn't happen. It's ingrained in their system. Um, and the, 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 probably the part that I love most about sprinting and why I do it so much with our guys is the concept of the speed reserve. I'm sure a lot of uh, people know about that. Uh, the higher we can drive up that max output, the longer we can operate at higher submax outputs or higher submax velocities. And uh, I think that basketball is primarily a, an aerobic sport. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would definitely say, yeah, guilty as charged. I don't know whenever when they're going to be at full speed on the court. It's it's a game of repeated accelerations. But the higher that speed reserve is, the longer they'll be able to, to repeat those accelerations um, during the game. Uh, sprinting is a plyometric. That's why we only do jumps once a, a, a one day a week. Uh, it, it, there is a flight phase where, where both feet are off the ground. Um, one one thing that uh, when I went to visit Westside Barbell uh, almost two years ago now, Louis Simmons told me the only difference between uh, flying and sprinting is ground contact. So it's, I mean, it's in my mind and I, in many people's minds, people are way smarter than me. Uh, sprinting is a plyometric, um, so that's another benefit there. Uh, going back to the, the fight or flight, I think it's almost injury prevention if you sprint your guys. Uh, we've seen it. I've seen it a couple times this past year, uh, playing other teams. Uh, a guy will be on a, be on a, uh, a fast break 
and his hamstring would blow out. Well, what happened there? It's uh, it's it's called a software problem. It's not a hardware problem. It's not, it's not muscular. It's neural. Uh, the the athletes' motor recruitment patterns are completely flawed, so that they don't they, they literally cannot recruit the right re- recruitment pattern. So there is actually a misstep in the firing pattern. No pun intended there. And then. Uh, like uh, we only have one day for plyometrics and we only have one day where we address agility. And I think sprinting is a way to, uh, get better at agility without actually having to do any agility work as well. Um, just sort of the, going back to the speed reserve agility, you're going to be operating a less, le- a, a less, a much less max, a much less velocity, sorry, than you will at, at, uh, at top speed. So, and you're getting all the benefits of that without the wear and tear on the, uh, on the athlete's joints and such. Um, but so that's the way we do it in the in the off season. Once we get more into in season, Jay, sprinting obviously isn't that big of a focus. We will we will micro dose the guys, maybe once or twice a week, just hit a full a full blown sprint, just to maintain the speed qualities and make sure they don't pop a hamstring uh, come game day. Um, in the weight room, it, the dynamic effort is the focus. Um, I, I believe the displaying your strength quickly is is uh, is of the utmost important and uh, developing uh, rate of force development. Uh, in season, uh, I believe uh, it was either um, Mel Siff or Verkashansky said in a super train that you could actually maintain your strength by only hitting about 70 percent uh, in season. So we don't go, go any higher, go any higher than that. And um, in season is a little bit different beast, especially the D2 level. You might only have your guys for one week or once a week or you might have them for three times a week. So it's, I mean, that's, uh, I have to get creative with that. If I only have the guys for one day a week, I'm probably going to hit a, a T day. Uh, for those familiar with the, the cheer system, if I have them for two days, I'm going to hit a T and an L. And obviously if I got them for all three, I'll hit the whole thing. But, um, just, uh, getting creative, especially at the D2 level in the team setting and, uh, just knowing what's important, I guess would be the, uh, my, my philosophy on that. Um, any questions on that so far? No, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a yeah. lot of really quick. I think one thing that would be really cool because a lot of people run into the misinterpretation that when they come onto campus, they're automatically ready for their tier system or all of these more advanced, if we may, methods. Let's talk a little bit more about your idea of maximizing the mundane. That's a great statement slash saying and how you use that with the younger kids. Because we actually do, it sounded like you were going in that direction, but it sounds like some of the stuff that we typically start our freshmen with. So let's, let's hear how a little bit more about that. So I, I love goblet squats. I love I, I love double kettlebell front squats. If they're if they're at my facility in the in the in the uh, in the team setting, um, yeah, I have I have no I have no desire to to put a barbell on those guys' backs. Uh, Coach Wesley is Coach Rick Wesley is one of the most open-minded thinkers. Uh, I think in 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 uh, at least our league, he's um, I sort of have with a unicorn in, in the industry where he's given me full autonomy of the program. He doesn't try to micromanage, um, anything like that. Um, but yeah, I like, I, if anybody, anybody who knows me, Jay knows, I love triphasic training and, uh, all of Cal Dietz's work, uh, pertain to that. So yeah, for, a, a, uh, when freshmen get on, uh, in here, Jay, I mean, it's, it's slow eccentrics, man. Um, you know, for six or seven seconds is trying to engrave those motor, uh, those motor recruitment patterns and just sort of, uh, make, make those, uh, movements concrete. Um, that, that might be anywhere from, from four to six weeks for those guys. And, uh, like I said, a lot, a lot, lot of dumbbells, some, uh, even some bands if I want. Um, and then they'll go into an isometric phase for the next four to six weeks. And then obviously, the, after that, they get to is, is the fun part. They get to see how far they've come and just you know displaying their strength quickly, if you will, on the focusing on the the reactive or the concentric portion um, of all the movements there. But yeah, um, yeah, it's it's you need to slow cook it. I, I think that's what I think that's what you're what you're getting at, especially with freshmen. Um, the temptation is there to to throw to throw a barbell on their backs, and I've made that mistake. I've made many mistakes, um, but. Um, yeah, it's 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 if those, these kids, especially freshmen, they probably never even stepped foot into a weight room before, uh, or a lot of them, um, at least the, the the populations that I that I that I work with at Grand Valley, 
Um, so yeah, I mean, just slow cooking it, um, getting the most out of each adaptation you possibly can. Um, you don't have to abide to, you need to change a stimulus uh, every three to four weeks uh, or the law of accommodation will set in. Like, it's okay. We can, we can slow cook this another two, three weeks. We can push it to seven. Um, but in some cases, but, um, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I would, uh, does that answer your question? No, uh, yeah, hundred percent. You know, and I think taking your time and, and making sure that the way I've said it is you don't want to change the clip until you've emptied the gun, right? Like if they're still getting better, what do you need to just because like we're, we're not there to, to, you know, if, if we were jesters, we would be there to entertain them. But if we can continue to provide whatever it was to keep them moving in the right direction. That's a, that's, that's, that's a great saying. I'm definitely going to steal that one. Where'd you get that one from? I, I think that I might've just not been sleeping one night. It just came out. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a great one. Yeah. But it's, uh, I, I think that's really like how I look at it is it's, you know, and, and that's how we handle everything with our guys, you know, and we're, I'm in a different situation, obviously, where it's, I, I can like physically like, put my hand on the kids, not only in the weight room, but, you know, it's, I, they're mostly what I got. So it's like, we're trying to eat lunch once a week with these guys and like getting to know them better. I mean, it's, cause that's sort of becoming more and more important with this generation. I think like those, like the idea of being like their friend and their coach makes them get a little bit more involved and then giving them the autonomy of having input in, in what we're doing just as long as they understand, like, yo, bro, just keep adding five pounds every time until you can't, and then let's change it. Like, at the end of the day, I'm not going to fight a basketball player whether he pulls the bar and it's sumo, conventional, or a trap bar. All I care about is, like, are you pulling it? Great. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Doing awesome, man. Can you do a five pounds heavier next time? Cool. Let's do that, and then let's move on. And I think that that's... Really what you're getting at is as long as you can continue to see your student athletes progress, then it doesn't matter, so to say, what what the textbook would tell you to do because little Johnny is still getting better at week five and six and seven. So why change it? Why would you? I mean, at some point, if you keep changing it, <laughs> uh, the, the kid isn't going to know what to adapt to. I mean, I, I, think you hit, I think you hit it right in the head. Yes. So then when you're looking at your guys, what are some things? So like people have a sort of want to use misinterpretation is kind of a little strong for what I'm going to try to get at here. But I think you'll understand what I'm saying. They, they, they have like misinterpretations of what basketball players should be doing because of how they play and this, that, and the other thing. What are some things that when these young kids that work at your facility come in and the kids that show up at GVSU, what are some things that you see commonly that are problems and or issues and or like, like buzzes that go off in your head that you know like, okay, this is probably something that I'm going to have to address anyway, so we go right to it with a, with a youth uh, college basketball player. Uh, it, it would go back to, I, I think all of them are pretty terrible benders would probably be the, the, one of the first things I would recognize, Jay. Um, and that's why I'm such a huge proponent of the slow eccentrics, just sort of ingraining that movement pattern very slowly, making sure uh, they get that down. Um, and also I got to do a lot of work on their on their ankles and hips, uh, whether that be with, with, with kettlebells, dor dorsiflexion. Uh, Buddy Morris has got some great uh, six-way ankles. Um some some banded good girl bad girl stuff that he that he's talked about and his um some of his uh, with videos with Joel Jameson, uh, but that'd be the, definitely the biggest one is not very good benders and uh, they, they got some problems with, with their ankles and hips that we gotta get loose start mobilizing more and more, but uh, yeah definitely those so, those two things to jump out. So then how does that impact the direction you go with them? So meaning when you look at things because being devil's advocate, if you're a bad bender and you've got bad ankles. Sprinting, mm. sprinting may be very challenging. So how does that impact your direction with all of that stuff? And how does that help you build moving forward, looking at a four-year plan with your guys? Mm -hmm. uh, if, you're at, if you're at my facility, 
uh, we, we will we will do a lot of um, sled, a lot of, pu- lot of focusing on the athlete and pu- pushing, uh, gain extension um, in the ankles, knees, and hips, um, sort of slowing things down, if you will. Uh, change in motor behavior, you got to get the, get the brain's attention. To get the brain's attention, we got to slow things down. Um, so if you're at my facility, a lot of sled works, uh, sorry, sled work, pushing, pulling, dragging, uh, things of that nature. Um, if we're at GBSU, we don't have that. It's a lot against the wall. Um, I, I, I know people, some people cringe when they see wall drills, but I, I love them. I, I think uh, they, they build great posture. They don't make you faster, but they, they do build great posture, which is number one on my checklist when looking at people's sprint form. Um, and then, you, you know, honestly, at GBSU, you, you st- uh, they, since we don't have some of these things, you got you, you got to get creative, Jay, right? We got to sometimes we got to put a plate down on the turf and they got to push it that way. And it might it might um, make some people raise an eyebrow or say, well, what the hell is Hunter doing? Like, you know, that's that's old school military stuff. What are we doing here? Uh, but it's it's sort of just what you got and, and just being, being creative. It doesn't have to be uh, complex. Uh, it, it, things can be simple, um, but simple doesn't always mean easy. So, uh, that that'd be the that would be the biggest thing is just getting the get changing motor behavior, slowing things down, a lot of sled work, a lot of wall work. Um, but uh, going from there, um, very low impact aerobic plyometrics, bunny hops, uh, sort of very very soft impact bounding uh, laterally or linearly. Um, I guess the 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 the, the you know, it only stops with your imagination, if you will. Yeah, no, and I think that a great spot that we can leave it at because. You, you're you're looking at two different ends of the spectrum, and a question that a lot of coaches ask when they come out here in the summer is, okay, but then how would I change that as a coach at level X, Y, or Z? So when you look and you're being creative, what are some things that you following like the plate? Could you give any more examples for people where it's like these are things I would really want to do, but because I couldn't do X. We did Y instead, and we're still pretty successful based on the resources we had available. Yeah, you have to get extremely creative at Grand Valley because, first of all, we use two weight rooms. We use, in the end season, we, we use the basketball or I sort of, I guess, the field house weight room where every team trains. You only have 45 minutes because you only, you only got uh, different, certain blocks of time before the next team comes in. But right now we're in the football weight room. We have a lot more, a lot more equipment. Um, there, there, there are GHRs, there are reverse hypers, there are all these, all these, all these, I guess, fancy pieces of equipment that we can, that we can take advantage of. And one of the big things that um, I struggle with, especially right now, because um, I would, def- I would definitely argue right now, because um, last year was my first year as, as the strength coach there, the guys are ready for some of the more, I guess, taxing demands, um, but I don't have everything that I want in the, in the football weight room. Um, so if we're, if we're, when we're in season, uh, once the guys have displayed that they can, I guess, use cat training, if you will, compensatory acceleration, uh, developed by Dr. F- uh, Fred Hatfield, then we'll throw some chains on there, but then there's no bands. We, we, we can't, uh, once they've fully adapted to that after, you know, a few months, Jay, we, we can't, it's like, ah, oh, geez, how do I, how do I do this now? Um, so obviously, obviously I've just, uh, made, made, uh, put on more chains. Uh, we've even done, uh, up to, up to two or three chains per, uh, per bar at some times, uh, just try and keep progressing and keep developing a, a new adaptation there. Uh, but we don't have any chains right now in the weight room that we're in for dynamic effort. Uh, so I, I'm not just going to slap a bunch of bands in the bar right away. I mean, I don't want to kill these guys. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we might just have to just, you know, just uh, say, hey, there's only 225 in the bar right now. I want you to act like there's 500 pounds in the bar, and just so there's they don't, so they're not uh, ever decelerating towards the top portion of the lift. And then from there, uh, I haven't thought about it this much, but we might have to just have to go, you know, micro minis to start the really thin ones first before we work up to the to the red mini bands. But that's definitely a big one. Uh, Jay is uh, sort of the different dynamic effort variations based on which weight room I'm in. And also there's no boxes in the, in the, in the, in the field house weight room, no soft boxes. Uh, so we got to do some, some more, some more hurdle work. Uh, we literally have, to, have had to jump on benches at times. Um, but in the football weight room, we can, we can do all sorts of seated box jumps. They got the nice, the nice soft row, uh, box, uh, box jump boxes in there and, um, everything like that for sort of other things, but they don't have hurdles in that weight room either. So it's, it's sort of trying to adapt to which weight room you're in based on the day. 
Yeah, no, man. And that's that's really what it comes down to is, you know, I think a lot of people think too that like in college, like you get everything you want, you have all the toys and bells and whistles and everything's there. You know, that uh, you run into the same issues at a lot of Division One schools too. And I don't think people truly understand that. You know, I'm, I'm a guy that's lucky to have a, bl- a bunch of toys, but there are still times where it's like, okay, well, we don't have access to X. So if this is really the direction we need to go in, how can we make it work and what can we do otherwise? And it's it's an interesting conundrum to be in because it makes you think outside the box a little bit is awful of a phrase and you know statement as that is, but it's it's really true. Like sometimes you just gotta put your creative hat on and and figure it out and go to work. Just making the slightest adjustments, right, Jay? I mean, whether it's a goblet to a double kettlebell to hands at your side, I mean you're right. Joint position dictates muscle recruitment, right? So just making just the smallest twi- t- uh, switch here and there, you'll get in a completely different adaptation. You're 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 exactly right. And um, the, like like I said, being tempted to go further than you have to with the athletes, especially at my facility, when I where I have bands, I have chains, and I get a get, get a kid who's a six ten junior, and he's going to be playing uh, Division One next year. It's like you know the the, te- the temptation is there to throw some chains in the bar, throw some you know do some bands or do do whatever whatever sexy if you will. But you know, I, I, I've 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 learned my lesson on that. I'm not doing that ever again. Um, you know, it, when it, in my experience, when things get fancy, fancy gets broken. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I'll tell you what, Hunter, this is an absolutely killer talk. I can't wait to get this up, man. I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today. This is uh, this is fantastic stuff, and really candid and open about how you train the kids, and and that's greatly appreciated because too many people aren't gonna a share what they do. Or B, give the credit where credit is due from the people who they learn from. So because of that, I, I can't thank you enough for, for your time and for being with us today, man. This is dope. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate that. I, I, I've told many people this before. Uh, paying it forward has got me into this industry. So I have I have I don't feel any 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 problem, or I don't want to not share what I've what I've what I've learned from all my all my friends and and uh, people I look up to in this industry. So uh, I guess I would just say, why wouldn't you share? Why wouldn't you? You know, we're all here to help each other. No doubt, man. Well, greatly appreciate it, man. This will be up real soon. This is awesome. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you, Jay. Yeah, man. And a huge thanks again to the Freak Factories, Hunter Charneski, for spending some time with us today. Guys, just some awesome stuff, you know, understanding the whole idea of maximizing the mundane and and being flexible with what you have available are two huge takeaways. And then I think, guys, one thing that he did in the talk that I I think is really important is, you know, giving credit where credit's due. You know, he, he referenced a lot of coaches and a lot of people who have helped him along the way. Uh, it's real easy to say, I do this, I do that, I do the other thing. Uh, but when you when you give credit where credit's due, I think that says a lot about about Hunter as a, as a coach and a person. So can't thank him enough for the open, honest, candid sharing and, and really for, for sharing who he learns from so people can, you know, put a couple names there on the internet and, and reach out to some more people to, to help them continue to get better. Uh, guys, as always, if you enjoyed the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. Uh, if you like the but if you like the talk, guys, and you're watching on YouTube or listening on iTunes or Podomatic, go ahead and hit that like button. Um, as always, guys, you know, feel free to share it. We're just trying to get great information out to all the great coaches out there. So you know, spread the wealth, share away. Uh, we greatly appreciate you guys that do that, and we greatly appreciate everything that you guys do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then. <laughs>